This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two The Education of a Personage. Chapter Two Experiments in Convalescence. Part Two Temperature Normal. The advent of prohibition with the thirsty first put a sudden stop to the submerging of Amory's sorrows, and when he awoke one morning to find that the old bar-to-bar -bar days were over, he had neither remorse for the past three weeks nor regret that their repetition was impossible. He had taken the most violent, if the weakest, method to shield himself from the stabs of memory, and while it was not a course he would have prescribed for others, he found in the end that it had done its business. He was over the first flush of pain. Don't misunderstand. Amory had loved Rosalind as he would never love another living person. She had taken the first flush of his youth and brought from his unplumbed depths tenderness that had surprised him, gentleness and unselfishness that he had never given to another creature. He had later love affairs, but of a different sort. In those he went back to that, perhaps, more typical frame of mind, in which the girl became the mirror of a mood in him. Rosalind had drawn out what was more than passionate admiration. He had a deep, undying affection for Rosalind. But there had been, near the end, so much dramatic tragedy, culminating in the arabesque nightmare of his three-week spree, that he was emotionally worn out. The people and surroundings that he remembered as being cool or delicately artificial seemed to promise him a refuge. He wrote a cynical story which featured his father's funeral and dispatched it to a magazine, receiving in return a check for sixty dollars and a request for more of the same tone. This tickled his vanity, but inspired him to no further effort. He read enormously. He was puzzled and depressed by a portrait of the artist as a young man, intensely interested by Joan and Peter and the Undying Fire, and rather surprised by his discovery through a critic named Mencken of several excellent American novels, Vandover and the Brute, The Damnation of Theron Ware, and Jenny Gerhardt. Mackenzie Chesterton, Galsworthy, Bennett, had sunk in his appreciation, from sagacious, life-saturated geniuses to merely diverting contemporaries. Shaw's aloof clarity and brilliant consistency, and the gloriously intoxicated efforts of H. G. Wells to fit the key of romantic symmetry into the elusive lock of truth, alone won his rapt attention. He wanted to see Monsignor Darcy, to whom he had written when he landed, but he had not heard from him. Besides, he knew that a visit to Monsignor would entail the story of Rosalind, and the thought of repeating it turned him cold with horror. In his search for cool people, he remembered Mrs. Lawrence, a very intelligent, very dignified lady, a convert to the church, and a great devotee of Monsignor's. He called her on the phone one day. Yes, she remembered him perfectly. No, Monsignor wasn't in town, was in Boston, she thought. He'd promised to come to dinner when he returned. Couldn't Amory take luncheon with her? I thought I'd better catch up, Mrs. Lawrence, he said rather ambiguously when he arrived. Monsignor was here just last week, said Mrs. Lawrence regretfully. He was very anxious to see you, but he'd left your address at home. "'Did he think I'd plunged into Bolshevism?' asked Amory, interested. "'Oh, he's having a frightful time.' "'Why?' "'About the Irish Republic. He thinks it lacks dignity.' "'So?' "'He went to Boston when the Irish President arrived, and he was greatly distressed, because the receiving committee, when they rode in an automobile, would put their arms around the President.' "'I don't blame him.' "'Well, what impressed you more than anything while you were in the army?' You look a great deal older. That's from another, more disastrous battle, he answered, smiling in spite of himself. But the army, let me see. Well, I discovered that physical courage depends to a great extent on the physical shape a man is in. I found that I was as brave as the next man. It used to worry me before. What else? Well, the idea that men can stand anything if they get used to it, and the fact that I got a high mark in the psychological examination. Mrs. Lawrence laughed. Amory was finding it a great relief to be in this cool house on Riverside Drive. 
away from more condensed New York and the sense of people expelling great quantities of breath into a little space. Mrs. Lawrence reminded him vaguely of Beatrice, not in temperament, but in her perfect grace and dignity. The house, its furnishings, the manner in which dinner was served, were in immense contrast to what he had met in the great places on Long Island, where the servants were so obtrusive that they had positively to be bumped out of the way, or even in the houses of more conservative Union Club families. He wondered if this air of symmetrical restraint, this grace, which he felt was continental, was distilled through Mrs. Lawrence's New England ancestry, or acquired in long residence in Italy and Spain. Two glasses of Sauterne at luncheon loosened his tongue, and he talked, with what he felt was something of his old charm, of religion and literature, and the menacing phenomena of the social order. Mrs. Lawrence was ostensibly pleased with him, and her interest was especially in his mind. He wanted people to like his mind again. After a while it might be such a nice place in which to live. Monsignor Darcy still thinks that you're his reincarnation, that your faith will eventually clarify. Perhaps, he assented. I'm rather pagan at present. It's just that religion doesn't seem to have the slightest bearing on life at my age. When he left her house, he walked down Riverside Drive with a feeling of satisfaction. It was amusing to discuss again such subjects as this young poet, Stephen Vincent Benet, or the Irish Republic. Between the rancid accusations of Edward Carson and Justice Cohallan, he had completely tired of the Irish question. Yet there had been a time when his own Celtic traits were pillars of his personal philosophy. There seemed suddenly to be much left in life, if only this revival of old interests did not mean that he was backing away from it again, backing away from life itself. Restlessness I'm tre old and tre bored, Tom said Amory one day, stretching himself at ease in the comfortable window-seat. He always felt most natural in a recumbent position. "'You used to be entertaining before you started to write,' he continued. "'Now you save any idea that you think would do to print.' Existence had settled back to an ambitionless normality. They had decided that with economy they could still afford the apartment, which Tom, with the domesticity of an elderly cat, had grown fond of. The old English hunting prints on the wall were Tom's, and the large tapestry by courtesy, a relic of decadent days in college, and the great profusion of orphan candlesticks and the carved Louis the Fifteenth chair in which no one could sit more than a minute without acute spinal disorders. Tom claimed that this was because one was sitting in the lap of Montespan's wraith. At any rate, it was Tom's furniture that decided them to stay. They went out very little to an occasional play, or to dinner at the Ritz or the Princeton Club. With prohibition, the great rendezvous had received their death wounds. No longer could one wander to the Biltmore Bar at twelve or five and find congenial spirits, and both Tom and Amory had outgrown the passion for dancing with Midwestern or New Jersey Debbies at the Club de Vin, surnamed the Club de Gink, or the Plaza Rose Room. Besides, even that required several cocktails, to come down to the intellectual level of the women present, as Amory had once put it, to a horrified matron. Amory had lately received several alarming letters from Mr. Barton. The Lake Geneva house was too large to be easily rented. The best rent obtainable at present would serve this year to little more than pay for the taxes and necessary improvements. In fact, the lawyer suggested that the whole property was simply a white elephant on Amory's hands. Nevertheless, even though it might not yield a cent for the next three years, Amory decided, with a vague sentimentality, that for the present, at any rate, he would not sell the house. This particular day on which he announced his ennui to Tom had been quite typical. He had risen at noon, lunched with Mrs. Lawrence, and then ridden abstractedly homeward atop one of his beloved buses. "'Why shouldn't you be bored?' yawned Tom. "'Isn't that the conventional frame of mind for the young man of your age and condition?' Yes, said Amory, speculatively, but I'm more than bored. I am restless. Love and war did for you. Well, Amory considered, I'm not sure that the war itself had any great effect on either you or me, but it certainly ruined the old backgrounds, sort of killed individualism out of our generation. Tom looked up in surprise. Yes, it did, insisted Amory. I'm not sure it didn't kill it out of the whole world. 
Oh, Lord, what a pleasure it used to be to dream I might be your really great dictator, or writer, or religious, or political leader. And now even a Leonardo da Vinci or Lorenzo de Medici couldn't be a real old-fashioned bulk in the world. Life is too huge and complex. The world is so overgrown that it can't lift its own fingers, and I was planning to be such an important finger. I don't agree with you, Tom interrupted. There never were men placed in such egotistical positions since, oh, since the French Revolution. Amory disagreed violently. You're mistaking this period, when every nut is an individualist, for a period of individualism. Wilson has only been powerful when he has represented. He's had to compromise over and over again. Just as soon as Trotsky and Lenin make a definite, consistent stand, they'll become merely two-minute figures like Kerensky. Even Falk doesn't have half the significance of Stonewall Jackson. War used to be the most individualistic pursuit of man, and yet the popular heroes of the war had neither authority nor responsibility. Guinemere and Sergeant York, how could a schoolboy make a hero of Pershing? A big man has no time, really, to do anything but just sit and be big. Then you don't think there will be any more permanent world heroes? Yes, in history, not in life. Carlyle would have difficulty getting material for a new chapter on The Hero as a Big Man. Go on, I'm a good listener today. People try so hard to believe in leaders now, pitifully hard, but we no sooner get a popular reformer or politician or soldier or writer or philosopher, a Roosevelt, a Tolstoy, a Wood, a Shaw, a Nietzsche, then the cross-currents of criticism wash him away. My Lord, no man can stand prominence these days. It's the surest path to obscurity. People get sick of hearing the same name over and over. Then you blame it on the press? Absolutely. Look at you. You're on the new democracy, considered the most brilliant weekly in the country, read by the men who do things and all that. What's your business? Why, to be as clever, as interesting, and as brilliantly cynical as possible about every man, doctrine, book, or policy that is assigned you to deal with. The more strong lights, the more spiritual scandal you can throw on the matter. The more money they pay you, the more the people buy the issue. You, Tom d'Anvilliers, a blighted Shelley, changing, shifting, clever, unscrupulous, represent the critical consciousness of the race. Oh, don't protest. I know the stuff. I used to write book reviews in college. I considered it rare sport to refer to the latest honest, conscientious effort to propound a theory or a remedy as a welcome addition to our light summer reading. Come on now, admit it. Tom laughed, and Amory continued triumphantly. We want to believe. Young students try to believe in older authors. Constituents try to believe in their congressmen. Countries try to believe in their statesmen. But they can't. Too many voices, too much scattered, illogical, ill-considered criticism. It's worse in the case of newspapers. Any rich, unprogressive old party with that particularly grasping, acquisitive form of mentality known as financial genius can own a paper that is the intellectual meat and drink of thousands of tired, hurried men, men too involved in the business of modern living to swallow anything but pre-digested food. For two cents, the voter buys his politics, prejudices, and philosophy. A year later there is a new political ring, or a change in the paper's ownership. Consequence. More confusion, more contradiction, a sudden inrush of new ideas, their tempering, their distillation, their reaction against them. He paused only to get his breath. And that is why I have sworn not to put pen to paper until my ideas either clarify or depart entirely. I have quite enough sins on my soul without putting dangerous, shallow epigrams into people's heads. I might cause a poor, inoffensive capitalist to have a vulgar liaison with a bomb, or get some innocent little Bolshevik tangled up with a machine-gun bullet. Tom was growing restless under this lampooning of his connection with the new democracy. What's all this got to do with your being bored? Amory considered that it had much to do with it. How will I fit in? he demanded. What am I for? To propagate the race? According to the American novels, we are led to believe that the healthy American boy, from nineteen to twenty-five, is an entirely sexless animal. As a matter of fact, the healthier he is, the less that's true. The only alternative to letting it get you is some violent interest. Well, the war is over. I believe too much in the responsibilities of authorship to write just now. And business, well, 
Business speaks for itself. It has no connection with anything in the world that I've ever been interested in, except a slim, utilitarian connection with economics. What I'd see of it, lost in a clerkship, for the next and best ten years of my life, would have the intellectual content of an industrial movie. Try fiction, suggested Tom. Trouble is, I get distracted when I start to write stories, get afraid I'm doing it instead of living, get thinking maybe life is waiting for me in the Japanese gardens at the Ritz, or at Atlantic City, or on the Lower East Side. Anyway, he continued, I haven't the vital urge. I wanted to be a regular human being, but the girl couldn't see it that way. You'll find another. God, banish the thought. Why don't you tell me that if the girl had been worth having, she'd have waited for you? No, sir, the girl really worth having won't wait for anybody. If I thought there'd be another, I'd lose my remaining faith in human nature. Maybe I'll play, but Rosalind was the only girl in the wide world that could have held me. Well, yawned Tom, I've played confidant a good hour by the clock. Still, I'm glad to see you're beginning to have violent views again on something. I am, agreed Amory reluctantly. Yet, when I see a happy family, it makes me sick at my stomach. Happy families try to make people feel that way, said Tom cynically. Tom the Censor There were days when Amory listened. These were when Tom, wreathed in smoke, indulged in the slaughter of American literature. Words failed him. Fifty thousand dollars a year, he would cry. My God, look at them, look at them, Edna Ferber. Governor Morris, Fanny Hurst, Mary Roberts Reinhardt, not producing among em one story or novel that will last ten years. This man Cobb, I don't think he's either clever or amusing. And what's more, I don't think very many people do, except the editors. He's just groggy with advertising. And, oh, Harold Bell Wright, and, oh, Zane Gray. They try. No, they don't even try. Some of them can write, but they won't sit down and do one honest novel. Most of them can't write, I'll admit. I believe Rupert Hughes tries to give a real, comprehensive picture of American life, but his style and perspective are barbarous. Ernest Poole and Dorothy Canfield try, but they're hindered by their absolute lack of any sense of humor. But at least they crowd their work instead of spreading it thin. Every author ought to write every book as if he were going to be beheaded the day he finished it. Is that double entente? Don't slow me up. Now there's a few of them that seem to have some cultural background, some intelligence, and a good deal of literary felicity, but they just simply won't write honestly. They'd all claim there was no public for good stuff. Then why the devil is it that Wells, Conrad, Galsworthy, Shaw, Bennett, and the rest depend on America for over half their sales? How does little Tommy like the poets? Tom was overcome. He dropped his arms until they swung loosely beside the chair, and emitted faint grunts. I'm writing a satire on them now, calling it Boston Bards and Hearst Reviewers. Let's hear it, said Amory eagerly. I've only got the first few lines done. That's very modern. Let's hear em if they're funny. Tom produced a folded paper from his pocket and read aloud, pausing at intervals, so that Amory could see that it was free verse. So Walter Ahrensberg, Afra Kremenberg, Carl Sandberg, Louis Untermeyer, Eunice Tensions, Clara Schanefeld, James Oppenheim, Maxwell Bodenheim, Richard Glanzer, Charmel Iris, Conrad Aiken. I place your names here so that you may live, if only as names, sinuous, mauve colored names, in the juvenilia of my collected editions. Amory roared. You win the iron pansy. I'll buy you a meal on the arrogance of the last two lines. Amory did not entirely agree with Tom's sweeping damnation of American novelists and poets. He enjoyed both Vachel Lindsay and Booth Tarkington, and admired the conscientious, if slender, artistry of Edgar Lee Masters. What I hate is this idiotic drivel about, I am God, I am man, I ride the winds, I look through the smoke, I am the life sense. It's ghastly! And I wish American novelists would give up trying to make business romantically interesting. Nobody wants to read about it unless it's crooked business. If it was an entertaining subject, they'd buy the life of James J. Hill, 
and not one of these long office tragedies that harp along on the significance of smoke. And gloom, said Tom. That's another favorite, though I'll admit the Russians have the monopoly. Our specialty is stories about little girls who break their spines and get adopted by grouchy old men because they smile so much. You'd think we were a race of cheerful cripples, and the common end of the Russian peasant was suicide. Six o'clock, said Amory, glancing at his wristwatch. I'll buy you a great big dinner on the strength of the juvenilia of your collected editions. Looking Backward July sweltered out with the last hot week, and Amory, in another surge of unrest, realized that it was just five months since he and Rosalind had met. Yet it was already hard for him to visualize the heart-whole boy who had stepped off the transport, passionately desiring the adventure of life. One night, while the heat, overpowering and enervating, poured into the windows of his room, he struggled for several hours in a vague effort to immortalize the poignancy of that time. The February streets, wind-washed by night, blow full of strange, half-intermittent damps, bearing on wasted walks in shining sight. Wet snow splashed into gleams under the lamps, like golden oil from some divine machine, in an hour of thaw and stars. Strange damps, full of the eyes of many men, crowded with life, borne in upon a lull. Oh, I was young! for I could turn again to you, most finite and most beautiful, and taste the stuff of half-remembered dreams, sweet and new, on your mouth. There was a tangling in the midnight air. Silence was dead, and sound not yet awoken. Life cracked like ice. One brilliant note, and there, radiant and pale, you stood, and spring had broken. The icicles were short upon the roofs, and the changeling city swooned. Our thoughts were frosty mist along the eaves, our two ghosts kiss, high on the long mazed wires, eerie half-laughter echoes here, and leaves only a fatuitous sigh for young desires. Regret has followed after things she loved, leaving the great husk. ANOTHER ENDING In mid-August came a letter from Monsignor Darcy, who had evidently just stumbled on his address. My dear boy, your last letter was quite enough to make me worry about you. It was not a bit like yourself. Reading between the lines, I should imagine that your engagement to this girl is making you rather unhappy, and I see you have lost all the feeling of romance that you had before the war. You make a great mistake if you think you can be romantic without religion. Sometimes I think that with both of us the secret of success, when we find it, is the mystical element in us. Something flows into us that enlarges our personalities, and when it ebbs out, our personalities shrink. I should call your last two letters rather shriveled. Beware of losing yourself in the personality of another being, man or woman. His Eminence, Cardinal O'Neill, and the Bishop of Boston are staying with me at present, so it is hard for me to get a moment to write. But I wish you would come up here later, if only for a weekend. I go to Washington this week. What I shall do in the future is hanging in the balance. Absolutely between ourselves, I should not be surprised to see the red hat of a cardinal descend upon my unworthy head within the next eight months. In any event, I should like to have a house in New York or Washington where you could drop in for weekends. Amory, I am very glad we're both alive. This war could easily have been the end of a brilliant family. But in regard to matrimony, you are now at the most dangerous period of your life. You might marry in haste, and repent at leisure, but I think you won't. From what you write me about the present calamitous state of your finances, what you want is naturally impossible. However, if I judge you by the means I usually choose, I should say that there will be something of an emotional crisis within the next year. Do write me. I feel annoyingly out of date on you. With greatest affection, Thayer Darcy. Within a week after the receipt of this letter, their little household fell precipitously to pieces. The immediate cause was the serious and probably chronic illness of Tom's mother. So they stored the furniture, gave instructions to sublet, and shook hands gloomily in the Pennsylvania station. Amory and Tom seemed always to be saying good-bye. Feeling very much alone, 
Amory yielded to an impulse and set off southward, intending to join Monsignor in Washington. They missed connections by two hours, and deciding to spend a few days with an ancient remembered uncle, Amory journeyed up through the luxuriant fields of Maryland into Ramilly County. But instead of two days, his stay lasted from mid-August nearly through September, for in Maryland he met Eleanor. End of Book Two Chapter Two Part Two